Awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today. We're going to be talking about um, building really high-performing engineering teams. Um, and it all starts with the people. So we're going to talk a little bit about hiring, and then we'll get into um, some more details on how to plan your roadmap, manage um, engineering execution, and uh, manage your engineers. Uh, but really, it starts with uh, building a great culture. If you don't have the right people on your team, none of the other stuff matters. Um, so how do you build uh, engineering excellence by focusing on, on the culture and the people that you're bringing on board? Um, so what this looks like is um, being really intentional from day one about who you're hiring, uh, but also who you're rewarding, who you're promoting, and what kind of values you're celebrating within your team. Um, so the way that we think about this is defining your values really early on and being really disciplined about holding people to those values. Um, it matters when you're bringing someone in the door if they're going to be a really strong values fit for your team and, and be a positive addition to the engineering culture um, and team that you're building. And so it's super important to create a really structured and rigorous interview process. Um, and it can always be really challenging, right? Hiring engineers is, is always hard. Um, it can be easy to want to compromise and you know, say maybe this person didn't quite hit all of the points uh, that we're looking for them to. Uh, and it's super critical that, that you continue to hold that really high bar uh, and be super intentional about the people that you're bringing on board. Because uh, one wrong hire can, can really derail an engineering team. And then finally, making sure that you're codifying your values uh, in your levels, in your promotion process, and ensuring that those really exceptional performers that, that embody that culture that you're trying to create uh, are rewarded and, and seen as sort of the example that, that people should live up to. Um, so I'll talk just a little bit about um, our sort of uh, some of the questions we talk about uh, during our interview process to really get at some of the uh, engineering values that are, are super important for our team. Um, so the way that we sort of codify our values is that we look for people who are ambitious and empathetic. And so the questions you see here um, are really meant to sort of tease out holistically how does a person think about the work that they're doing, what motivates them. Um, we really look for people who have a high ownership mindset. So they're excited to um, take responsibility for the work that they're doing, think creatively about how to solve problems, um, and be really autonomous in the work that they're doing. I think if you hire engineers like that, um, then you can set really high-level goals and give those engineers a lot of autonomy to figure out how to achieve those goals, which can result in a really high-performing culture because people are motivated, excited, and um, probably thinking of ways to solve problems that, that you as a, a manager or leader um, might not have even thought of. Um, and so these are, these are just a sample of some of our interview questions that really try and dig into some of that values fit. Um, they, can be, they can be broadly applicable, but your organization might have slightly unique values or, or traits that you're looking for. And I think the really critical thing is to um, find questions that you feel like you can get a really sort of high degree of signal on, where you can ask these questions and you can um, come away from an interview and, and say, yes, this person has the right um, sort of mindset and motivations. That can be a really ambiguous thing to, to dig into compared to something like a coding interview where it can be really obvious, like, did they solve the problem or did they not solve the problem? Uh, but I would argue that, that these questions and, and those sort of values fit interviews are um, just as critical as, as the technical interviews. OK, so you have an engineering team. You've hired people. Um, how do you structure that engineering team to be able to execute on, uh, on your product roadmap and, and actually ship the things that uh, you want to be shipping? 
So there's two really common uh, sort of ways of organizing engineering teams. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the, the sort of pros and cons of, of each of these approaches uh, and how to think about uh, maybe when the right time is to go one direction versus another. Um, so functional teams are, are typically how uh, a lot of really early stage companies sort of start out. This is how we started out. You have a small team, um, and it makes sense to organize around more sort of functional areas of ownership. Uh, so we have a back end team, a front end team, et cetera. Uh, the benefit of this is that it creates a lot of flexibility of resources. Um, you're able to prioritize work um, based on what's sort of the highest priority uh, products or features uh, to be working on, and teams are able to flex across different product areas. Uh, the problem, though, can be that you sometimes end up with a lot of resource contention where you know, maybe the back-end team has um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff on their roadmap and isn't able to um, prioritize work that the front-end team needs. And that can create a lot of sort of like um, coordination cost when you're having to go back and forth between those teams just to ship a feature. The other really common structure uh, are vertical teams, or um, sometimes it's called like the squad model, uh, very oriented around uh, sort of the product focus area. And that team is self-sufficient and able to sort of execute full stack on whatever that product is that they're focused on. Uh, this typically is, is more successful when you get a little bit later stage and have just a little bit more sort of like confidence in longer term roadmap. Uh, because the downside of, of doing this too early is that you might end up with um, sort of product teams that have varying degrees of priority projects. And so if, if one team is, um, has like a dozen like P0 projects to work on uh, and the other team doesn't consistently have um, that many P0 projects, that, that means that you're sort of maybe wasting resources and, and not having everyone working on, on things that are really sort of critical. I think as, as a company develops, you're able to um, sort of have more confidence, but in the early days when you're, you're still trying to find you know, product market fit, you're still iterating really quickly, uh, product priorities can, can change super rapidly. Uh, so this is just an example of sort of how we organize our engineering team. Uh, we have about 25 people on our engineering team, so still relatively small. Um, and the way that we uh, think about organizing it is sort of um, a few different product vertical areas. And then we have our platform teams that are meant to sort of uh, support the work of, of those product teams. So we have things like um, infra, data eng, and and then our core backend team that's sort of responsible for the health of our um, backend services. And then on top of that, you have teams that are focused on, on different areas of, of the product. Um, we have one team, our, our fraud products team, that is sort of the most nimble of, of these teams. It's, it's very small and more even R&D focused. Um, I think that can be an interesting way to continue to really foster innovation even as the team continues to grow and scale. Awesome. So how do you make sure that teams have the right resources to succeed? This is meant to be a, a very sort of rough example of, of what might make sense in terms of a, a product vertical team um, and, and how to structure that so that you have sort of autonomous resources that, that have everything that they need to be able to execute on, on that product roadmap. So for us, this typically looks like a couple front end engineers, a few back end engineers, designer, product manager. Um, um, and then an engineering manager. And that pod is sort of able to execute um, full stack on, on the work that they're doing. Building a really solid management team is, is also super critical um, to ensure that uh, your engineers have the right guidance, feedback, and, and growth opportunities. The way that we think about sort of structuring engineering management is having a mix of um, people on the team that are sort of rising through the ranks and, and start as an IC engineer and grow into a manager role, as well as hiring in managers externally. Um, the people that are, are coming from within and, and growing into that manager role will really intimately know um, the engineering challenges that you're facing, your product, et cetera, and that can be really valuable perspective. 
but you also probably want people who um, have done this before, are, are really strong in people management, can bring best practices from uh, companies that they've worked at previously uh, and sort of introduce those in, into your team. Um, we focus a lot on making sure that we have the right sort of management to IC ratio as well. Um, so we aim for like five to seven direct reports. Uh, that's typically on one team, but depending on sort of um, the size and scope of, of a team, it might be, might be two teams. Um, and then finally, as a startup, I think the, the thing that uh, time and time again um, just becomes really clear is that you have to be super flexible and scrappy and, and just know how to operate um, without too many resources, maybe without uh, someone really giving you a ton of guidance in, in a lot of cases. And so we really think about making sure that we're hiring people that um, have some startup experience and have dealt with a lot of ambiguity in the past because I think sometimes if you're coming from a bigger company, you might not even realize all of the support systems you had and can be sort of um, thrown off the deep end than if you're joining a startup and, and all of a sudden don't have any structure or process um, to sort of figure things out. Okay, so we've built our engineering team, we have um, figured out the right sort of structure given um, where we are as a company. Uh, how do you go about then planning the work that you're doing, building your roadmap, and, and figuring out how to um, focus engineers on the right problems? So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to think about evolving your planning as your company continues to grow and scale. I think this can look very different uh, for different phases of growth. And I think it's really important to um, continue to evaluate whether you're doing the right sort of planning process as your startup continues to grow. Uh, so I think in the very early days, when you have a really small team, Flexibility and nimbleness is really table stakes. Your product roadmap is going to be evolving quickly. You want to be able to respond to um, the new information that you're getting from customers, the market, uh, the work that you're doing, and be able to adapt your roadmap uh, accordingly. And so the way that we sort of did planning in our, our very early days was basically having just kind of like a high level list of key priorities, um, but then really planning sort of project by, by project and checking in week to week on um, whether we were working on the right things or whether we needed to reevaluate what those priorities were. Um, I think really frequent touch points then are super important because uh, you want to make sure that everyone is on the same page and focused on, on the right things and do so without too much structure because that process can end up just slowing you down. So we did things like have the entire team do um, a stand up a few times a week, talk through priorities and, and really be able to uh, troubleshoot quickly about whether you're focused on the right things, blocked on something, um, and whether you need to adapt your plans. So company continues to grow and scale. How do you think about evolving? How you think about that planning process? Um, so the, the way that um, we sort of did our next phase of, of planning and um, growth was basically evolving into a more monthly cadence, so still very far off from you know, maybe a quarterly planning cadence or, or even annual planning cadence that, that a larger company will do, but introducing a lot more structure than that kind of ad hoc week-to-week um, -week prioritization. We started to build the muscle of building a quarterly roadmap, but wouldn't sort of plan um, a quarter in advance since we were still getting so many um, new inputs that were influencing how we were thinking about our priorities. Um, Flexibility continued to be really critical here, and so that's why we started to plan um, month to month where we could check in and, and make sure that if new priorities came up, we uh, didn't have to redo all of our plans to adjust, but also had enough sort of clarity and visibility for the team um, a few weeks out in terms of, of what they were going to be working on, making sure that um, go to market and other cross-functional stakeholders that were starting to become more important also had clarity on, on what we were building, what they could be talking to customers about, and all of that. 
At this point, we started to, to introduce a little bit more structure, too, in terms of just how we thought about capacity planning. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, later on. But basically starting to introduce more sort of like project management structure, ensuring that you're, you're setting deadlines and understanding sort of like how your engineering team is performing starts to become uh, more and more important. So as you continue to grow, um, obviously you're going to need to get a little bit more sort of forward looking in, in terms of how you think about your roadmap. Um, and so by the time we were about 20 engineers, we started to shift to a more structured quarterly planning process, things like PR launches, um, early sort of like customer uh, partners as we started to do betas for new products, all of those things start to become really important. And you can't do that if you don't know what you're going to be shipping um, a quarter or more uh, in advance. And so at this point, we, we started to structure a, a much more concrete quarterly roadmap, understand um, timelines for projects, uh, even, even a bit beyond a, a quarter, depending on, on the scope of the project and, and how large it was. Um, at this point, we also introduced a lot more structure in terms of um, sort of how we do reporting out on project status. Uh, you have six or seven, maybe more engineering teams. Uh, really important that they're also able to understand what other teams are going to be working on uh, in case they have dependencies. All right, so you have your roadmap. You have your plans. Um, how do you make sure that engineers are actually able to build the things that they're supposed to be building and aren't getting sort of pulled in a million directions? Uh, it's a really hard problem at a startup where there's always so many different competing priorities, so many different requests coming from different teams. How do you make sure that you're able to actually focus and deliver those really large, important projects? So here's a few tactical ways to help uh, create some of that focus for uh, your engineering teams. Uh, we do a, a no meeting day on Wednesdays. I think having that structure um, helps people also think about how they break down their week. Um, and so different teams will um, kind of think about this differently, but often will group a lot of their meetings on other days and, and try and protect uh, as much of the other time as possible. I think one of the, the great things about um, being a startup and, and hiring people with a really high um, degree of ownership is that they're really excited to tackle a problem um, when it comes to them, right? So maybe a customer is, is facing an issue, uh, go-to-market team has, has a question about a product. Um, people are always excited to jump on those things, uh, but if you're constantly doing that, that can create a lot of context switching and, and really slow down um, the work that people are doing. And so we try and create a little bit of structure there so that people don't feel like they're constantly having to react to incoming questions or, or jump on um, whatever the latest thing is. And so we, we use linear for all of our issue tracking. And we have um, a few different sort of processes within linear in terms of um, people reporting bugs, triaging those bugs, uh, people uh, requesting new features and how we think about triaging that and creating some structure essentially to make sure that um, those issues are getting looked at and, and people are paying attention to uh, those incoming sort of questions and, and bug fixes, uh, but that it's not everyone on engineering's job to always be doing that so that they can, they can focus on those big rock projects. Um, and then finally, uh, so we are uh, critical infrastructure for our customers. Reliability is, is super table stakes for us and has been a really important part of our culture from um, day one. And one of the ways that we ensure that we're able to deliver on that is having a fairly structured on-call rotation um, that's there for uh, major outages if and when they happen, but also to be able to um, be more flexible in, in tackling some of those uh, 
bugs and other feature requests as they're coming in without having to sort of entirely shift priorities from uh, the main project that they might be working on. So essentially thinking really intentionally about um, sort of how you structure uh, engineering time and, and carving aside some time for people to be more reactive and dealing with those things that are um, coming in on the fly but also making sure that the bulk of your engineering time is, is focused on um, shipping those major projects. Okay, so um, we have roadmap, we have plans, we have our engineering team structure. Um, I think one of, one of the most important things about building a, a really high performing engineering team is how you think about um, measuring performance and creating growth opportunities um, for individuals on your team so that um, they feel motivated and excited and um, people feel like they're being held to a really high standard and are excited to, to meet and exceed that standard. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit first about um, measuring individual performance and then we'll talk about uh, measuring team performance. So, as you're growing your engineering team, often in the early days, you won't have a ton of structure around engineering levels. At a certain point, um, you're gonna introduce engineering levels, which creates a lot more um, sort of structure and clear sort of growth opportunities for, for engineers on your team. Uh, but it can be really challenging to ensure that you have the right career growth opportunities for people before you introduce those structured levels. So how do you make sure that people are getting really important and valuable feedback uh, without necessarily sort of being overbearing in terms of, of process and structure when you're an early stage team? There's a few different ways that we did this. Um, we introduced really lightweight performance reviews super early on. Um, I think this can be really valuable for a startup where uh, there's always you know, 10,000 different things happening and um, taking the time to actually sort of uh, step back and have um, that performance conversation with people uh, might get just sort of you know, lost by the wayside if you're not really intentional about creating those checkpoints. Um, but it's also super important that, that people are getting feedback because I think if you have really high performing engineers, they want to know how they're doing. They want to know how they can get better and they're really excited to grow. Um, and getting that feedback is, is super critical to keeping them excited and motivated. Uh, we made sure to create individual development plans so people could um, sort of see their growth opportunities, make sure they're on the same page with their manager about what that growth and career development looks like. Um, and making sure that you are reviewing, you know, compensation and um, being intentional about how you think about kind of rough bands of compensation as you're going to um, need to codify that even more when you start to introduce um, engineering levels. And then finally, just making sure that you're actually taking time to celebrate and reward um, the values and um, work that, that is, is really great. Uh, and you can do that with things formally like comp, but one of the things that, that we've done from the beginning that I think has been super positive is we have a Slack channel praise, um, and people can just jump in there and um, praise people on the team for the work that they're doing. Um, you know, maybe someone helps me figure out how to solve a bug, I can just jump in there and praise them. And I think that sort of ad hoc, lower stakes um, recognition can, can feel really valuable. At a certain point though, you're gonna to wanna to introduce levels. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to um, have uh, sort of those clear and consistent expectations, makes it more clear how to do compensation. Um, it helps with hiring. Oftentimes people might be coming from a slightly larger company that has engineering levels and wanna know um, sort of you know, where they're gonna stand within your company and what those career growth opportunities are going to be like. And levels can be a really effective way of communicating that. Uh, introducing levels uh, 
and doing it at the right point in time can be a really tough situation to navigate. I think you're building a startup and, and you're focused on you know, building a product, um, getting customers, and spending a bunch of time on building a leveling framework and, and rolling that out to your team uh, can seem like, like a lot of work. Um, and so it's, it's easy to, I think, like punt it down the road. Uh, and I don't think you should do it uh, like so early that you know, maybe you only have like five to 10 engineers. That's, that's probably a little too early to do it. But I think by the time you have a few different managers and start to need to make sure you're being sort of um, fair and consistent across engineering teams, uh, that's when it can become really valuable. I think our point of view is that you should do it a little bit too early rather than a little bit too late. It's going to take a lot of time uh, to roll it out. But once you've rolled it out, I think it um, can really accelerate uh, things like performance reviews, um, promotions, and all of that, and, and make it a lot easier for managers to um, also hold their engineers accountable. Uh, so do it a little bit too early rather than too late. Um, that can look very different for different companies, depending on uh, sort of the, the type of product you're building, maybe the time the company has been around. I think uh, the longer engineers are with you, the more important levels become, because they want to make sure that they're able to progress uh, through their career. Uh, and I think ultimately, you'll know when it's time. People will bug you about it. Uh, you can probably wait a little bit longer once the first few people start bugging you. But I think it, it'll feel pretty obvious at a certain point. All right. How do you measure team performance? Uh, you're able to you know, hold engineers accountable now to um, the expectations uh, for an individual. But how do you make sure that the team as a whole is, is also performing? So there are a few different pieces to this, and, and it might look different depending on, on the size and stage of, of the company. But I think making sure that you're able to um, set really clear goals, uh, set deadlines for projects, um, make sure that there is appropriate rigor in sort of how engineers are estimating um, the time it's going to take them to uh, finish a project, and that they feel really good about the deadline that they're setting and then hold them accountable to that deadline. Um, obviously, things always happen, and, and you're not always going to hit every deadline. And so when that does happen, um, making sure that you're sort of reflecting on um, why a project got off track and, and how you can learn from that experience. Uh, so I'll show a few quick examples of um, sort of how we do this at Stitch. Uh, so this is a screenshot from our um, linear of our product roadmap. Uh, basically, you can see a few different um, features that are in the works here. Uh, this is our sort of roadmap view. And you can see um, how projects are tracking. If you click into those, you can see um, more details like status updates on how the project is tracking. We pipe these out into Slack, too, so it's really easy for everyone to stay on top of um, how a feature is progressing, what the status is, what's still to be done. Um, and this can create really good cross-functional visibility so that everyone at the company um, knows what's happening, uh, when to expect new features, and um, can sort of plan accordingly. So that's all I had for you today. Um, hopefully, these are some helpful uh, pieces of advice in terms of, of how to run uh, really high-performing engineering teams. Thanks so much.